Hello, Ignite crowd. Thank you for joining us so much for this panel today, which is entitled Bringing Next Generation AI Innovation to the Enterprise. I'm joined by three amazing uh, panelists. Sam Motamidi, who is a partner at Greylock, which is one of the top uh, VCs in the Valley, in the world, specifically uh, a great focus on enterprise and, and building enterprise companies. Um, next is Evan Reiser, who is the CEO of Abnormal Security. Abnormal is a startup uh, backed by Greylock that is doing amazing stuff in the cybersecurity world. And then Dean Perrine, who is the CISO of Fox. Um, and they're going to talk to us a little bit today about um, working with Microsoft, working in the enterprise, and about the promise of AI. So going to the promise of AI, you know, AI and ML and data science and all these words that have sort of been thrown around almost as like buzzword bingo have been around for, for many years. And we've kind of thought a lot about where they would ultimately land. Sam, you guys are on the forefront of, of finding companies and helping build companies in this space. You know, as, as we think about bringing this to the next generation, what are the things that you look for as you think about the right kind of companies to back and broadly, how do you think that the sort of promise of AI is actually, um, is it being fulfilled right now? Thanks, Jeff. And it's a pleasure to be with you guys here today. I, it's an excellent question. So you know, at Greylock, we've over the last few years witnessed the incredible potential and growth of AI to drive business transformation across verticals and across workflows. And every week we meet with new entrepreneurs who are starting AI enabled businesses we also interact with customers and Fortune 500 enterprises who are eager to understand and act on the potential impact of AI on their businesses. There's a variety of market statistics out there, but, but I think you know, most people anticipate overall spend on AI to be well north of $100 billion by 2023. And, and so there's a lot of excitement around what can be done. The interesting thing is, despite the excitement, the investment, the number of companies there's a gap in the actual impact AI is having inside customer environments and across different business workflows. And there's frustration on, on the enterprise side around, hey, I've spent a lot of money and effort on different AI infrastructure, AI applications, AI tooling, and there's not a lot of ROI to show for it. And we've thought about this a lot. And if I, if I think about why is that happening, there are a couple of primary reasons. The first is a lot of companies are sort of AI first, but are not actually focused on real customer problems. And so they come to us and pitch us on, hey, here's a new AI company, but they don't actually connect the value that that AI can drive back to an important customer problem. I mean, the second issue is a lot of companies use AI more as a marketing term, but when you actually look under the hood at what they're doing, there's not real AI that can drive quality and differentiated software value. And I think the third challenge we see newer companies fall into is if they have AI product built, if it's aligned against a customer problem, then there's a question of how do you scale that product efficiently and with quality. And so to connect this back to sort of the turning point and, and what do we look for when we invest in AI companies, I, I'd say overall what we're looking for is companies that are solving customer problems with superior products that leverage data sets and AI and the application of AI on top of those data sets to drive superior value. And so we think a lot about for a new company, what's the workflow that you're going to transform? Is there data either in the customer environment or outside of the customer environment that you can leverage and train your machine learning models on? And then can you actually deliver that value uh, scalably and with sufficient quality? So Sam, you touched on something interesting there. And one of your points was around real AI versus sort of the, the marketing AI. Dean, as someone who has to buy or who's looking to buy AI solutions and, and obviously look to be on the cutting edge of what's happening, how do you distinguish you know, what's real and, and what's just marketing jumbo or what's buzzword bingo? Yeah, well, you know what's funny about the word bingo? So we actually walked around RSA with a buzzword bingo sheet that someone by the name of Kelly Shortridge made from, from uh, another company. Um, and we were just checking off how many companies were using ML or AI as part of their marketing lingo. Um, as, a, as someone in cyber, and specifically for our team, uh, and I think Evan would agree with this, that 
you know, so many companies are, are using that as a tactic now, as Sam said, they, they come at you with, you know, AI ML first versus talking about the problem that they're trying to solve. I think that one is, is one thing to check on is, are, are you getting bombarded with that? Or are you actually talking to the vendor only about the problem and them showing you how they're solving the problem? And then, you know, the proofs in the pudding, the results, the results should speak for themselves. I think one thing, you know, especially working with Abnormal over the last uh, several months is, it, it, I mean, it was just, it's just a game changer, right? The proof is in the pudding. It's its so obvious when it works uh, that, it, that it's very clear. You know, it's kind of funny um, when I work with some companies that are that are in this space, they'll, they'll integrate, they'll say, all right, hold on, we need to go we need to go uh, set some things up for you over the next couple of weeks and we'll be back. And then they show you the results uh, and then you can't do anything with those results for, for a period of time. And then uh, anytime you add new data, again, they need to pause and go off and work on something. And the kind of feeling there is that, you know, they're obviously massaging the data a little bit to get it to all work. What was amazing with Abnormal and, and some other companies that have come out is it gets plugged in and boom, it just starts working immediately. And it's it's very obvious and they're very just focused on the problem itself. So Evan, that's, uh, let, I know this has been hard for you probably to stay quiet for this long, but <laughs> now, now I'd love to talk to you a little bit about really what is the solution and, and what are you guys doing and how are you using AI differently than sort of maybe the, the traditional person trying to solve solve this problem would? Yeah, well, um, you know, th thanks again for ha uh, having us, Jeff. Um, I mean, one thing that Sam said that really resonated with me is the the kind of the idea of like focusing on on problems first. Um, when we when we first started uh, the company, um, you know, even though me and my team we come from advertising technology, which is or an advertising technology background, which is infamous for using behavioral modeling to you know um, you know improve those improve and personalize those products. You know, we didn't we didn't start thinking, hey, we have a great we, we're great AI people. What can we go do? We actually talked with you know probably a hundred or two hundred you know uh, Fortune one thousand customers, and we just said, hey, what are the biggest problems you guys have, and you know what what um you know what kind of keeps you up at night? And by far the most common answer we heard was you know email securities and specifically social engineering and supply chain compromise. And um, you know we we didn't try to um, you know I think co coincidentally the right solution for that involves you know machine learning AI and it's probably the reason why we we attached gravitated to gravitated to it so strongly. Um, but you know that's been our kind of approach to stay very focused on that problem and you know it, it turns out that the way we solve it is through AI and machine learning. But when we talk with our customers right we don't start off you know just what Dean said like we don't start off saying hey check out this cool machine learning right like cool stuff we're doing you know we basically. We, we try to show how well we understand the problems. We, you know, we let our solutions speak for ourselves. And when our customers say, wow, how are you guys able to do this? Or I've never seen anything like this. Then we explain, hey, it's really AI machine learning behind the scenes. And I think that that approach to be very, you know, customer focused and kind of solution focused has been, um, you know, an advantage for us, you know, relative to, I think, you know, some of so, so, uh, some other cybersecurity companies that are very technology first, and it's kind of unclear what they do and how it works. and how well it integrates, you know, into, into you know into the enterprise. So having having the three of you guys on this panel at a Microsoft event, right, is is not something I would think that you would have thought. You would certainly not saw me. You probably wouldn't have thought. And I know Evan, you you weren't when you started. Um, you know, you, abnormal. You weren't necessarily uh, a big Microsoft person at that point. You know what 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 has brought you guys here, and sort of what what role do you think that Microsoft can play? in you know building it or 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 in bringing ai into the enterprise or in in basically fostering innovation um in the enterprise with ai maybe some could talk a little bit about that i mean you and i had an early conversation where we talked through uh, you know really what we're trying to do and and i, I never introduced myself obviously i'm the the gm of microsoft for startups have been here um for five months and have tried to find and work with people like Sam and Evan and Dean um, to really solve a problem for them, which is how do we bring more innovation into the enterprise um, and how do we unlock that? And certainly, Sam, you guys are gatekeepers a lot of that innovation. So when you think about Microsoft largely or working with Microsoft or having your companies, what are what are some thoughts you have on that in terms of the surprising things that you've seen or the, the challenges and, and, and are, is this something that you 
um, think you'll try to get other companies of your type of, from your portfolio to try to try to pursue? Yeah, it's it's a great question, Jeff. Um, you know, I'd start by saying, you know, just to give folks some context, like we at Greylock over the years, we've had the privilege of partnering with many cybersecurity and infrastructure companies more generally, several of which have gone on to be leading franchise public companies. And with Abnormal, we've been very impressed with the early traction they've had in the enterprise market and, and the ability that they've had to partner closely with Microsoft and Microsoft for startups to generate that traction. So, you know, a couple of things I'd note, right? One is I want to go back to things like both Evan noted on and, and Dean speak to, spoke about as well which is what does it mean to do an AI company right, right? And I think we talked about starting with extreme focus on a customer problem, but then I think the second component, which is also very, very important is how do you actually drive real AI with sufficient quality and scalability to solve the customer's problem? And I think this dynamic plays out very nicely for Abnormal because their value prop to the end customer is so directly tied to the quality of their AI and the quality of their ability to detect and prevent these advanced email threats. And they've gotten strong leverage from working with a partner like Microsoft, who's put a lot of time and investment into the different AI services that they make available to their partners, and then leveraging some of those underlying components to deliver this value to their end customers. So I think that's one piece that we've seen and been very impressed by. I think the second piece goes back to what Evan mentioned when he started the company and just his customer focus, which has really been on the largest and most lean forward enterprises in the world. And what's been most important for the company's success to date has been their traction uh, with those companies. And I think it's worth noting that Microsoft has, you know, extremely attractive relationships with customers in this segment and also reputation and ability to partner with companies and bring companies into this segment We've seen abnormal benefit from that. And I think to the last part of your question, Jeff, like absolutely, as I think about our enterprise software portfolio more broadly, there are a number of companies that could benefit on both of these vectors by working more closely with Microsoft. All right, well, I'll get those names down later. I'll get them <laughs> down. Um, Dean, from your standpoint, you know, as, as, as Sam has mentioned, a lot of the, these ideas, um, you, you're someone that is, is looking to innovate, obviously, within your own company. As you think about, you know, build versus buy and that type of thing, you know, what what challenges do you have in working with startups? And does Microsoft as a partner help overcome some of those challenges? Um, you know, how, how, how as an entrepreneur should one think about, you know, selling into someone like yourself? Yeah, no, it's a great question. I think, you know, well, first off, Fox loves working with startups, specifically our cybersecurity team. Uh, We love working with startups, especially uh, startups such as Abnormal, of course. I think Microsoft provides a a lot of the resources and backing and the technology infrastructure uh, to make make these things possible. Like Sam said, and Evan said, you know, you have to have results in order for these things to be successful. And the reason why Abnormal has been successful and has this traction is purely because of the results. Um, so I think my advice is to, to get in partner, partner with a, with a company that actually has the ability to provide the infrastructure and their own resources, like Microsoft's own AI, um, technologists, uh, as a kind of force multiplier for your own team, uh, to really accelerate this stuff and, and kick it off. I think if I, if I had to say one thing, it's, you know, abnormal, it, it'd be the best five minutes of integration effort that you've ever had to return on investment because it's so it's just so clear and direct uh, from what we've experienced. So I've been, I appreciate you saying that, Dean. He gave I mean, you a nice commercial there. I know, I know, it's great. Um, so, I mean, one, one thing I'll, I mean, I kind of want to second what, what what Dean said. I mean, I think one, you know, going back to your question around, you know, the some of the benefits we, we've seen from work, working with Microsoft, I think it's kind of, you know, t- two, two sides of the partnership I'm really excited by. One is on the technology side where, you know, obviously Azure is, you know, world-class security and privacy. As a cybersecurity company, right, we have to have, you know, incredible cybersecurity, you know, our own cybersecurity and our privacy and security needs to be kind of top of the line. So I think just having a, a secure platform built on top of is really important. Um, I think leveraging some of the, the you know, native um, AI tools of Azure. Um, also getting, you know, kind of, you um, uh, you know, maybe special access, right, to some of the you know early betas and the, the internal product. You know, that's been phenomenal. I think most of that stuff is like probably pretty well known by by most entrepreneurs. 
I think the other side of the coin is, is less known, and that is really around some of the, the business benefits. Um, I mean, some of the things I'm really excited by, um, you know, I work with Microsoft is like our customers are also Microsoft customers, right? So there's a lot of opportunities around um, kind of co-marketing and co-selling where, um, you know, we can work together to help our customers, you know, solve some of their business problems. And so, you know, going back to like, you know, when, when, Sam, when Sam and I were, you know, really starting the company back in the day, we were really focused on how we help customers solve problems. And, you know, we see Microsoft as an accelerator to help us do that, you know, um, better at, and at a larger scale. What what advice would you give to sort of enter, to entrepreneurs that are thinking about sort of selling into the enterprise? And, and like you you now are, I think from my standpoint, you know, the, the company that I started before you and I met at Twitter, selling an enterprise and we had no idea how to do it and i think that a lot of I, I would assume that you you came from a background where you had no idea how to do it either what what have you learned in these sort of two plus years about selling into the enterprise that what are like the the what's the one lesson that you would tell future entrepreneurs about the difference in selling you know a consumer a consumer type product versus an enterprise type product well i'm, I'm still figuring out to be frank i'll probably ask i'll probably ask dean for his advice which might be better than mine um, I mean, a couple of things, I think, you know, just kind of to repeat what Sam and Dean said, I think saying really focus on the customer problem. That's all that really matters, right? Can you build a great solution that's differentiated? Um, I think the, the second one is just being um, you know, very open-minded when you work with customers. Like they give you, you know, like half, you know, half our product roadmap probably came from you know, Dean and his team, right? So I think it's just being very open-minded about the right way to do things. I think Silicon Valley can be a little bit too inward focus. So sometimes a lot of the answers are, you know, in your customer's heads, not yours. And the final thing is just the the importance of, you know, kind of credibility. And, um, you know, I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of misleading marketing. There's a lot of kind of um, hand waving. And I think one thing I've been really proud about our team is just being, you know, very, very straightforward and kind of having a really kind of no BS, you know, culture, right? And I think that's, that's served us well. But, but Dean, I'd love to yeah, hear yeah. your advice for other no, entrepreneurs too. Absolutely. Well, and, and kind of what I meant by the, the five minute thing was, make it easy, easy to use and easy to integrate, right? So it's not, there wasn't a huge amount of work that we had to do when when dealing with that. Normal as to other companies, they they might have not have done all the legwork to figure out, okay, w- once a customer buys the product or they want to POC the product, what's it then going to take to integrate into the environment? Enterprise teams, technology teams across the boards, in particular cyber teams, are, are understaffed, they're overworked, they have a lot going on. So the the smoother you can make that and just say, hey, give me two minutes, five minutes of your time and we'll prove it. I mean, that goes that goes a long way for our team, at least. I think it's a good point. And going back to like the promise of AI, right? The promise of AI is like you have these magical machines that kind of go through all this data and make your life easier, right? And so I think, you know, making sure that the entire, our entire product experience is very frictionless, right? If you have this like 30 day onboarding, 30 day evaluation, right? You need like 10,000 PowerPoint slides to go, go explain why it's valuable. Like that's not you know, really very incongruent with the promise of AI. And so, you know, one thing I think that, um, you know, I, I've been proud of what we've done and, um, you know, just like keeping it really easy, really straightforward. Um, and then kind of like Dean said, like letting the results speak for itself. We need to sell people on AI. We just need to show them great results, right? If they're curious about how it works, we can go into the, the technology. But um, I mean, again, Dean, I, I defer back to you if you think this is true, but I think uh, a lot of people in your shoes, like it really just comes down to like, hey, like, does it work? Is it differentiated? And is it going to be super easy to like run and operate? And if so, like that's that's a good potential match. Well, yeah, and, and it's definitely in the cyber world, right? It's a it's a smaller community. Um, I mean, tech in general is, uh, you know, a lot of people know each other. And so once you start proving that out, you, you gain this this critical mass and people start talking about it and you know, you become kind of known for that, as I think ab- abnormal is here. So, um, so yeah. No, it's interesting because many of the concepts that you're talking about, Evan and Dean, are, are not unique to enterprise, right? It's like, how do you make a customer's life easier and how do you solve real problems, right? And the enterprise aspect of it sounds always scary because of long procurement cycles and all that kind of, all that kind of thing that makes it, um, incongruent to like sort of uh, uh, what it what it means to be a startup and be able to move fast. One thing that would be interesting and, and, and you know, I think we're, we're coming up against time. So maybe the last question is when you think about working and, and I don't know if Sam or I'll throw this out to any of you guys, but when you think about working with someone early on in an enterprise situation, how do you um, prevent their roadmap from derailing your roadmap? I, I know you mentioned, Evan, you, you want to use them 
very much to help drive your roadmap, but I've seen it before where companies get overrun by one customer that tends to make up so much of their, you know, their their roadmap, and then then they end up becoming unsuccessful because they just are building for one for one customer. So I don't know any ca cautionary words there, or any words of wisdom. You know, one thing I'll say before you guys jump in is like I think a lot of startups struggle between like, hey, should we be very technology focused or very sales focused, right? Should we like you know do build out the product roadmap to help sales or build the product roadmap based on technology? I think both those answers both those answers are kind of wrong. I think what's worked really well for us is being very customer focused, and um, it doesn't mean that um, you know you do everything customers tell you to, but like you really try to listen to their problems, right? You let the customers bring the problems, and you bring the you know the solution. Um, and I think that that just kind of being clear about that has been really helpful for us. And we don't build things because customers want them. We build things because the market wants them, and we understand that by talking to you know dozens and dozens of customers and doing the pattern matching. And I think that's that's helped us you know focus some of our you know our technology development in you know in in a way where there's very few things we build that like end up not being useful because they're very you know problem and customer you know focused. What else did you guys add? Yeah, I think that's well summarized, Evan. I mean, I so I would go back to something you said earlier, and then I think Dean you also touched on, which is. If you're an early stage entrepreneur and you're building for the enterprise, the most important thing is having a very tight feedback loop from the customer back to product development. And the tighter that feedback loop is and the more iterations you get going early, like the faster you're gonna build the product that the market wants, right? And so I actually, I think a lot of entrepreneurs we meet are, are, are scared or feel like they're not ready to go work with enterprise customers. And, and sort of the push I always give is, no, 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 like go there now work with a sufficiently wide set that you think represents the market broadly so that Jeff, to your point, you don't overfit any specific environment. But for example, you work with five customers across verticals, maybe they have slightly different IT environments. And then you feel like, okay, if I build product that these five customers love, I actually feel like I built product that the market broadly will love. And just, and then the last thing I'll note on this, and it, it also comes back to sort of what customer segment to focus on and large enterprise versus SMB and everything in between. People often talk about this notion of product market fit. And I, I love the notion, but it's not binary. Like you don't have product market fit, yes or no. You have to look at it at a, at a segmented level by customer segments. And so like one of the things I think Abnormal did very early and, and continues to do now, in part because of partnering with folks like Microsoft is, hey, our customer segment is, is enterprise accounts. And we want to deliver like the superior solution for large enterprise accounts. So we have to go work with those customers early and work with folks like Dean and build build solutions that are going to drive value in their environments because those environments might look very very different than an environment at a company that has 50 employees. So it's worth remembering that piece as well. To totally, and I think there's a lot of companies that don't kind of build in that customer obsession with their culture. I think that's really important for and that's the beauty of working enterprise, right? You can um, you have customers that will tell you exactly what they want. You just have to listen, right? And I mean, I know like every single support email we get, I get a copy of, and you know, our team is, you know, it's part of our culture to take that feedback seriously and, um, you know, listen to customers and help them solve the problems. Yeah, it's interesting, Sam, that you brought up product market fit as a concept, because when we think about many of the challenges that we have or how we think about customer segmentation of our program broadly, a lot of it is, is around this idea of understanding pre-product market fit, post-product market fit. Like that's what I we said initially, like for post-product market fit companies, we really believe we have an opportunity to um, to really accelerate their business growth. But then as we look at it, it, it isn't binary, right? It, it, it isn't like there is this gray area where you're still figuring out product market fit. The other thing that we believe we can do is help you get to product market fit quicker um, by giving you your first POC, right? By by connecting you with those first kind of customers. So something that's interesting that that you mentioned is you know finding those first five customers that are a good cross section of different you know verticals or different environments or have slightly different circumstances. Um, but we believe that you know from from our standpoint as Microsoft for startups, that's one of our biggest goals is to give um, you know uh, help. You know we basically just want to accelerate. The startups through their life cycle you know there's there's mvp building your first minimal viable product can we help you there once you get to product market fit can we help you get to product market fit quicker and then once you're at product market fit can we help you accelerate the business value or your revenue growth and that that's the ultimate goal of what microsoft for startups is doing and, and why we're so excited to work 
with abnormal and with with you know Greylock and with Fox because like this is just you know it, it's so synergistic that everyone's happy, right? There's not like any partnership. You talk about gives and gets and this idea of us just really trying to help everyone along. You know, when when you and I first talked about this, I said, hey, what what does a partnership look like with with Greylock? How can we help you? And you said honestly, if you can help our portfolio companies accelerate their revenue, that's the best gift you can give us. And so. I've taken that to heart as I've thought about the program broadly, um, and it's it's obviously one of the reasons this is a, such an exciting panel to do. Is there um, any other like sound bites or things people want to mention before before going off? I, I I obviously want to mention real quickly that if you're interested in in hearing more about abnormal or listening to Evan and I banter more with each other about our trips to Vegas. Um, you can join us for a 15 minute session about why the most promising startups are choosing Azure, and that's um, September 22nd at 7.30 p.m. Pacific time. Any last words from the panelists? No, I think it's all just super excited to partner with Microsoft and, um, you know, just, uh, yeah, I feel very fortunate to get to work with all you guys. Yeah, I feel fortunate to get to work with you guys too. So thank you guys. Thanks for joining us. And hopefully we'll see you guys on September 22nd at 7.30 p.m.